gentleman has forgotten more about the Constitution than our current occupier in the White House ever learned about it. If you know what I'm saying. This guy knows the Constitution left and right. He's a professor at Taft College, and he's teaching our kids the right way. The American way. The Constitution way. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Harold Peace. Round of applause. Thank you. As a young boy, I learned of the greatness of our early patriots, and I was certain that I would be uh, among them with my own rifle in the American Revolution. George Washington could have counted on me as he crossed state lines, and when, when he looked back and, and to see that half of his men didn't cross, he would still find me. I would have been at Valley Forge in those freezing temperatures without bread or clothes to keep me warm, fighting with him for the very existence of the Continental Army. Much later, when I learned that only a third of the colonists were, in fact, patriots, another third were too apathetic to be on either side, you know those type, and that another third actually aided the British. I wasn't so certain. Would I see beyond the new towns and the Virginia Techs in their day to see that there existed a much larger reason to oppose gun registration and eventual gun confiscation than appeared on the surface? My question is answered today for me as it is for you as well. You're here. Forget Democrats, forget Republicans and liberals and conservatives. These are labels to cause someone else to do your thinking for you. This is about the Constitution that all officials, when elected, swore to uphold, and many are not. This issue is so serious that it is a certain litmus test to political parties and individuals differentiating those who respect this document from those who clearly do not. The Second Amendment could not be made clear. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Militia in their day consistently referred to the people. I have read every version of this sentence as James Madison formulated, uh, formulated it. It was the second most important freedom next to the expression freedoms of the First Amendment which it secured. Actually, nothing is secured without it. Yeah. Yeah. I too weep for the children at Newtown, Columbine, Virginia Tech, and now my own city of Taft, California, where I too was locked down while police resolved the gun violence of a 16-year-old student with a, gun, a shotgun in the classroom. Last summer I had a three-year-old grandson die from an accident, uh, accidental gunshot to the head. But these losses cannot and need not be resolved by violating the Constitution. <laughs> Mr. President, neither Congress nor you have any authority to do anything on the right to bear arms outside of changing the Constitution by an amendment. It is well to remember that the Second Amendment existed because the states would not support the new Constitution without a guarantee that you would never deprive their citizens of their right to bear arms. That language was so strong and clear, uh, the strongest and clearest that they knew how to make it. No sentence in the Constitution was stronger. The amendment was specifically addressed with you, 
the federal government in mind. What is it that you do not understand about shall not be infringed? Yeah. Yeah. Nor may you limit Congress and President, nor may you, Mr. President, go into the Oval Office and unilaterally make an executive order limiting or denying these things as Congress alone is constitutionally empowered to make law. Yeah. Your making law should be an impeachable offense. Yeah. Congress, you may not legislate the Second Amendment away by giving authorization to some types of weapons over others or approving some types of ammunition and denying others. Unfortunately, you appear to be too weak to stop the executive branch from usurping your authority and that of the public. Even that specifically denied you, as is the Second Amendment. You will be replaced by those who honor the Constitution as quickly as we can do so. Yeah. Yeah. I know of the bogus argument that the Second Amendment applies only to the National Guard, but anyone reading anything on the subject by the Founding Fathers knows otherwise. The militia was defined in the Second Continental Congress as every able-bodied male, 17 years of age and older, the citizens. The National Guard was created in 1903 by the Dick Act, over a hundred years later, which still defined the militia into the organized, divided the militia into the organized and unorganized militia with the people retaining the unorganized militia. It has not changed from the Second Continental Congress. I taught the Constitution long enough to know all the arguments attempting to give place to the federal government over the guns of its citizens. None of them pass muster from the founder's perspective. They these arguments attract and appeal to only the less informed or those who intentionally want to take away our liberty. It's time to call a spade a spade, perhaps, huh? <laughs> Many may not remember their basic U.S. history courses, and a little review might help us understand why the Second Amendment exists in the first place. Certainly, when enacted, there was no thought of restricting type of firearm or where or who could carry. So its placement as the second most valued freedom in the Bill of Rights had nothing to do with personal safety or even hunting. These were already assumed. It was specifically placed right after the freedom, uh, freedom of religion speech, press, and assembly to make certain that these freedoms were never taken from us. When the ballot box fails to protect the republic, the cartridge box has to be resorted to. Yeah! It was aimed, if I may use this word in this context, squarely at the government. <laughs> to understand it more fully, one must remember that the early patriots did not ask the existing British government if they could revolt against them. They argued in the Declaration of Independence that they were, quote, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end of quote, coming from a much higher source than mere man, and that, quote, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it 
and to institute new government, end of quote. Thank you. God is referenced five times in this document, and thus they believed he sanctioned their rebellion. They were expected to suffer evils while sufferable, quote, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Yeah. Why was it their duty? And your duty today as well. Because no generation has the right to end and to thus deny to those who follow what was freely given to them. Yeah. The right of revolution requires the means of revolution. And this is why the Second Amendment exists. Normally, the ballot box is um, the only self-correction that is needed. But they had no intention of giving up the same right that they exercised to give us freedom in the first place. Nor were they pious enough to assume that their correction would stay in place and that future generations would never need the more serious self-correction as they had. The wordage of the Second Amendment was stronger than any other sentence in the Constitution, as I've said. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They saw this right as being connected with a free country and specifically forbade the federal government any authority with respect to it because historically it was always a government that took away freedom. <laughs> 